Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to introduce Sheg Tiam, who is the academic dean at the School for International Training based in Vermont. He's lucky enough to have a position that allows him to spend part of his year in Dakar. So he's joining us from Dakar this afternoon. And um, we're very pleased to have him with us remotely. Sheg has a BA from Université Sheikh Antetiop in Dakar and an MA and PhD in Comparative Literature from Binghamton University in New York. He's the founding member of the Dakar Institute of African Studies, and he's also the associate editor of Research in African Literatures, which is the premier journal in African literature. Um, before joining SIT, Sheg was an associate professor of African American and African and French at Ohio State, and he also directed um, programs, um, study abroad programs in Senegal. He is prolific in terms of his scholarship. He's the author of a book, Return to the Kingdom of Childhood, Re-Envisioning the Legacy and Philosophical Relevance of Negritude, published in 2014. And he's also the editor of Negritude Reloaded, a special issue of the Journal of African Philosophy. He has a more recent book manuscript, Negritude Beyond Negritude, Glissant, Gilroy, Mabanku, and Senghor's Afrocentered Philosophy. Today, he's going to be speaking about COVID-19, coloniality, and the limits of Western arrogance, thoughts from Africa. Welcome to CAS and our Friday Barraza. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Brenda, uh, for, for your kind words. Thanks, uh, the African Studies Center, for inviting me to give a Barraza lecture. And um, thank you to Todd, Todd, Todd Leedy, uh, for uh, also inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here to join um, the University of Florida. Uh, in um, sharing some of my thoughts uh, today. So uh, my presentation will, uh, will focus on four points. I will take first uh, the liberty to quickly state my conceptual framework uh, that is um, today uh, the decolonial methodology. I don't define myself as a decolonial scholar, uh, but I am using the decolonial methods to, um, to think about uh, the, the, the issues at stake. Uh, I will subsequently analyze the way the arrogance of the West has led to the prediction of the doomsday for the African continent and limited Euro-America's ability to take on the COVID-19 challenge before I argue in my conclusion that the humility towards all living things as taught by African vitalist ontologies may offer a perennial solution uh, to coronaviruses. I'll get back into that. Uh, but although the global mat matrix of power is usually read as essentially uh, detrimental to the global south, I will argue today that it's equally destructive of the West. I am tempted to coin the term toxic coloniality. Of course, um, uh, you will have heard somewhere um, my implication toxic coloniality makes us think of uh, toxic, uh, toxic masculinity. As a matter of fact, toxic masculinity helped me think of what toxic coloniality um, could be. Uh, so the concept of toxic coloniality postulates that coloniality is not only harmful to colonized peoples and spaces, but it is also detrimental to the West. This concept could, as a matter of fact, be applied to Malcolm X's uh, famous, the chicken went home to roast comment after the assassination of JFK. In fact, what Malcolm X meant was simply that the violence that led to the death of JFK was nothing but a direct effect of coloniality in itself. So toxic coloniality and the naturalization of violence goes back home and has a detrimental effect on, um, on the West itself. The same can be said of the recent white supremacist attack on the capital and the wage crisis in the US beyond color line since the 1990s. As stated, uh, I will explore the effects of coloniality and the representations of Africa's experience with COVID-19 and analyze the limits of toxic coloniality on the West's engagement with the world and its consequences on its management of the pandemic. It is important to state, state my positionality 
I am an African, an African scholar, and a senior administrator traitor at the US-based Global Institution of Higher Education, the School for International Training. The idea of Africa is the focus of my intellectual engagement. And as an administrator of an institution that offers undergrad and grad courses and programs globally, every new or continued invention of Africa has a direct effect on my life and the life of my institutions, our local communities, families, and students. The dehumanization of Africans with seemingly neutral discourses on COVID-19 can lead literally to the closure of programs and the furlough and in some instances, termination of African faculties and staff whose programs can be affected and their livelihoods as well. The decolonial stand that I use here thus is not just an intellectual intervention, it is a political plea that has a direct if, uh, a political plea uh, for us to, to make a stand against decoloniality and a certain representation of Africa. Because at the end of the day, what all of us here have in common is that we care about the place that some of us call home and that has gladly opened its arms for most of us. So as said, uh, I will start uh, with um, uh, some, some notes on why a decolonial uh, methodology or intervention today. So one of the basic principles of the decolonial tradition is the acknowledgement that we live in a world founded on the principles of Western modernity. The pervasiveness of modernity and its corollary coloniality is such that, it's a, that it affects all aspects of life. And yet, while modernity is often defined as a triumph of reason, marked by the invention of the subject and the respect of individual freedoms in the, in the aftermath of the irrational Middle Ages, we Africans are aware that it is quite different for the peoples of the South. As a matter of fact, it is for us, the advent, modernity is the advent of a world based on the dehumanization of the non-Western subject and their engagements with the world. Thinking, therefore, must start from the possibility of thinking beyond the universal paradigm. As we, stay, as we say here in Dakar, when, somebody gives, when someone gives you one choice and asks you to choose, it is because they are trying to fool you. As stated, I will start today from the postulation that the advent of Western modernity corresponds with the period that begins with the arrival of Europeans in the Americas and reaches its maturity in the 18th century in the midst of Western imperialism. When Europe considers the revolutions of the 18th century as the result of a miracle that sprung from the ties of Jupiter and the maturity of which is illustrated by the triumph and recovery of reason, we, Africans in particular, people of the South in general, know very well that the construction of Europe and the creation of capital, the overexploitation of our raw material and the occupation of the markets that led to their light and our darkness is the result of the control of the triangular trade that destroyed the subaltern economies and the, and the result of the colonial occupation that annihilated them, abolished our political organization, burned our gods, killed our leaders, and led to the epistemic subjugation of our peoples. In this modern and colonial paradigm, humanity is only possible when it participates in the universality of the West. Life has value only when it is conceived in terms of the difference between man and nature. States are worthy only when they, when they function as republics founded on Western tradition. And knowledge is valuable only when it comes from the Western epistemy. To exist in this world is to constantly try to catch up with Europe and its universal subject. To exist is to try to develop in search of lost time in order to enter history. And here I'm talking about history with capital H in reference to Hegel. It is in this sense that some countries are said to be underdeveloped and their inhabitants consequently not quite human while others are considered developed because they have reached human dignity by their rationality and their economic independence. I will, as stated, begin by analyzing 
the racist discourses on Africa, which since the beginning of the pandemic has used the terms of coloniality that I just mentioned to predict our future, thereby participating in the continued, continued denigration of Africa. On the other hand, I will also look at the ways Western arrogance and its subsequent dehumanization of the continent has also led to its own demise. This arrogance will be opposed to the humility and not the modesty, they are two different things that Africa has traditionally shown and which has this time prepared us to face the coronavirus and avoid so far the doomsday pre predicted by some. I will finish this talk by saying that the keys to a post-COVID-19 era are to be found in what can be called African vitalist epistemologies, as I stated uh, earlier. These epistemologies are what I think are epistemologies of humility, if, if I may say. Uh, my reflection, this entire talk, will be in light of the wall of wisdom. Uh, could this big could wall of thumb? Uh, I'm sure there, there are a couple of wall of speakers here. Could this big could wall of thumb? Arrogance, arrogance leads to decay, while humility, humility is a lifeline. The second section of this talk uh, will be based on the first uh, part of this wall of saying, could this be reflections, I will think about the implication of the end of the world in Africa, or at least what has been presented as the end of the world. There has been for the past year, an outcry on the continent over the racist remarks made by the director of um, uh, the World Health, Health Organization, Tedros Ghebreyesus, who is an African, those of two French doctors who wanted to turn Africa into a research ground for testing their vaccines, namely Professor Jean-Paul Mira, head of the emergency department at the Cochin Hospital, and Prof Camille Loche, the, the director of research at the National Institute of Health and Medical Research in Paris. The words of Gabriel and those of the French doctors were also emulated by the French president, but those of the French presidents with equally obscene uh, meanings, but which made a lot less noise. We talked a lot less about uh, Macron's obscene words, but they are just as colonial as those of the French scientists and, the, and, that of the, and those of the director of WHO. The analysis of these discourses will allow me to engage with the limits and pervasiveness of Western coloniality. So what did Gabriel say? In a statement reminiscent of Hegel's uh, representation of Africa as a dark continent where the sun never sets, Gabriel declared in March nine, on March 19, 2020, exactly a day from today, uh, a year uh, ago, Africa must wake up. My continent must wake up. It, you know, when, when one hears that, uh, we cannot help but ask who really helps these um, people write their, their speeches or who, who gives them advice when they talk. Uh, but those who keep telling us that humanities are not, the humanities are not important. Uh, this is what you get uh, when um, you, you don't take the time to learn about history. So um, this statement was relayed by all major news outlets BBC, CNN, The Guardian, and even by African news medias. And these statements reminiscent again of Hegel's representation of Africa as, as, as the, the eternal uh, country of darkness, of the night where the sun never, never, never sets, is here um, uh, repeated unconsciously by the director of WHO. But there's also something more shocking. Uh, it, they, during a broadcast on LCE, a major French uh, TV station, two prominent French doctors and scientists, two leading French doctors uh, and scientists say, say basically this. I'm, I'm sharing my screen right now. Uh, I think you can all see. Can you see the screen? Yes. Oh, okay, perfect. 
taille des choses parce qu'on sait qu'elles font... Elles sont hautement exposées et elles ne se protègent pas. Qu'est-ce que... Qu que vous en pensez Alors vous avez raison et d'ailleurs on est en train de réfléchir en parallèle à une étude en Afrique justement pour, pour faire ce même type d'approche avec le BCG, un placebo. All right, uh, we all heard it. Uh, and these are not just anyone. Um, these are two leading French scientists uh, who, who, who speak uh, like this in very colonial terms, and we'll get back to that. Uh, during the same period, a journalist of RFI, uh, RFI is Radio France Internationale, the, the, one of the major radio stations, uh, francophone radio stations, uh, asked the following paternalistic question to Emmanuel Macron, the, pre the president of France. Uh, what can we do for African countries that lack resuscitation beds? What can Europe do? What can France do? Uh, and um, before you start uh, getting mad at the journalist, let's hear what Macron replies. I quote, we want to help, Macron says, absorb the shock and therefore mobilize the other G20 powers to help build capacity and provide African health systems with what they need. As you said, they need beds and respirators. Respirators. So we have to be able to buy these materials for them. We are in the process of producing them for our own systems, but I want us to be able to produce more so that we can also supply our African partners. We have to do everything possible. And that is why I have talked a lot with our African partners so that they decide to contain the pandemic as much as possible and delay it. The more they delay it, the more the Europeans are in a position to bring them help. We are in 2020, and that's the president of France that is speaking. The words of the director of the World Health Organization, those of two very influential French scientists and those of the French president, show the constant tradition of dehumanization of Africans to whom the first asks to wake up, uh, the second assimilates to animals that can be used as guinea pigs and whom the third wants to help to buy beds and respirators after having asked them to wait like children for their benefactors to come and save them. You know, after you listen to, 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 to these people, especially to Macron, you just feel like saying, yes, Massa, thank you, Massa. I wonder why they don't just assign us, after all, a minister of health, since it is the president of France who designs our public health program. One must wonder, where, that, where does this fatuity come from? This self-satisfaction, which is displayed in an insolent and ridiculous way by what my grandmother would call the curious attitude of someone who is in the middle of a burning hut and seems to be worried about their, their neighbor's burning cake. Indeed, this is particularly surprising in that these words were pronounced at a time when the West is crumbling under the weight of COVID-19, of COVID while Africa was still holding strong. I mean, one of, one of the things that is amazing is that these speeches, these discourses are presented in a context in which Africa is really containing the spread while the West is, um, is, uh, is, is, is about to, to crumble. Let's compare the reactions of the West and most African countries to better understand the way coloniality continues to imagine an Africa that doesn't exist uh, in order to define uh, as a West that is only subliminal. So this is exactly what's happening during this time, around March, March uh, 2020, when these, um, these um, speeches or these um, statements were made. France closed its school and confined its citizens on March 17. They already had nearly 7,500 cases and 200 deaths. Italy confined its citizens seven days earlier on March 10th, when it already had 9,000 cases and nearly 500 deaths. New York closed its schools on March 22nd, where there were already 34,000 cases in the US 
As I speak, while the United States is still one of the epicenters of the pandemic, there is a segment of the population that has managed to have their states open in the name of the free Western subject. We'll talk about the arrogance of that again later. During the same time, most African countries closed schools and imposed some type of restrictions or lockdown before they even had 50 cases. Even more interestingly, in January 2020 already, a conference was organized in Dakar that brought together a third of the African countries in order to prepare the pandemic in a collective way. We barely had any cases at that point. It took the West months and thousands of deaths to talk seriously about cooperation. And still, who should really advise who? In spite of everything, the French president or the director of the WHO tells us that Africa must wake up. The big Western media, such as the New York Times, the Financial Times, repeated the same things. I wonder, I know, I don't wonder, I believe um, that it's not, a, I, I, I ask, but this is a rhetorical question, if it wasn't for themselves to feel good and continue the spiral of their own humanization that they only conceive from the dehumanization of the other. After all, why has the West missed the boat? Is it because, as usual, it had overestimated its capacities? While our traditional situation needs more attention, we'll talk about that again later. But to understand how the situation was normalized, it is important to compare it with the very invention of races. When in the early modern period, races were invented, this invention was linked to the illusion of a subliminal white self. In the invention of Africa, Mudimbe uses the example of Hans Bergmer's painting, Exotic Tribe, to remind us that historically, the representation of Africa and Africanness have less to do with Africa than with the discursive practices that have led to particular meanings of Africa and not others. In other words, what is happening in the representation of Africa has more to do with what Africa is, has less to do with, that, with what Africa is than with what Europe ought to be. In other words, when in the 18th century, major scholars such as Hegel, Kant, and even Hume dehumanize Africa and place us outside of history, what is really happening is something else. They are really defining the subliminal white subject. The darker the continent, the lighter the enlightened West. What one can see in the manifestation of coloniality in the discourse, discourses of the director of WHO, Emmanuel Macron and the French scientists is in fact exactly the same process that, le that, that led in the 18th century to the uh, invention of Africa. What is happening here is an illusion of what the West could be. There's something unconscious here in the colonial discourse that humanizes the West as they dehumanize the so-called non-West in this particular instance, Africa. It is, there's something humanizing to distance oneself from Africa. Even when it is as absurd as in the case of Macron, who is thinking of giving us respirators, beds and medical supplies, while we are managing better than he is. It is thus logical, as long as we remain in these spheres, to imagine the African as a human who is not one. In this sense, why not make them guinea pigs? And when we want to, help them develop, that is to say, humanize them as the French doctors and presidents propose. So in other words, these moments of invention of dehumanization of Africa has nothing to do with Africa, but it has all to do with what Europe imagined itself as. Since Europe or the white subject or the African subject is nothing but the complete opposite of a subliminal white self. 
When Macron comes and talks about COVID in certain ways, what he's doing is talk about Africa's experience of COVID in, in this dehumanizing way. What is really happening unconsciously is that he is reassuring the white subject and the Western subject. Yet as stated, this dehumanization of Africa and its corollary, the invention of an imagined superhuman West or Western subject is not only detrimental to Africa, it is also toxic and ultimately destructive to Europe. And in this case, Euro America. The other side of the darker side of modernity is not necessarily the enlightenment as the decolonial scholars may argue. It is often also the illusion of enlightenment that unfortunately one ends up believing. The problems with il illusions, however, is that when reality hits, there is little to be done. The Wolofs have a beautiful saying that Fentarlo, Adju Fedul, Doina J Duma. Fentarlo, Adju Fedul, Doina J Duma. You don't need to beat a grown man who lies about being rich. He will feel the pain similar to that of a whip the day they have money problems that they can't solve. COVID-19 has been this day for the colonial West. It has unveiled the illusion of mastery of the future and of predictability that constitutes one of the foundations of Western rationality. In fact, it is the arrogance of Western rationality rooted in an anthropocentric understanding that man is master and possessor of nature and that the promise of predictability that explains the difference of reactions between those who know that they don't master anything and those who have the illusion that they dominate the universe. It is this arrogance rooted in the scientific illusion of certainty that has brought the West to its knees. This illusion, which makes the human being master and possessor of nature and which promises them the mastery of the present and the future, while we master very little, risks losing us forever. And I'll also come back to this uh, later. So I spent time uh, talking about the arrogance of the West um, through the wall of understanding that could this geek uh, heaviness or arrogance will sunk you. Now I'm gonna move to the other part of the talk, still from the other side of the same saying, of timber. It is lightness that will be your, um, uh, or humility for that matter, that, you, that can be your, your lifeline. And here the question that I'm asking is, what can the world learn from Africa in the wake of this crisis? I will start by saying that I do not believe in simplistic dichotomies that do not take seriously the complexity of life. So of course, this talk um, is not necessarily just a simple opposition between Europe and Africa, America and Africa. But I am however proposing to reflect on the possibilities of thinking about our future differently. In this particular case, I am, I am opposing really um, worldviews that are fundamentally modern and colonial and worldview uh, that are indigenous and um, uh, not colonial in this particular sense uh, and um, uh, therefore more humble. I have noted earlier that the effect of the caricature of Africa during this pandemic uh, has led to a certain representation not, on the, of, not only of the continent, but also of Europe. I subsequently emphasized that the different ways in which Africa is dealing uh, with the pandemic can uh, be used as examples to think differently. I will now focus on what Africa can teach the world uh, about ways to deal with the coronavirus. I don't mean here COVID-19, but coronavirus, which is a recurrent virus that has been the basis of several epidemics. The second, COVID-19, is the disease that is the consequence of this year's um, SARS-CoV-2. About a year ago, Suleiman Bashirjan, a Senegalese scholar, declared in an interview in Le Soleil, a local newspaper, that the victory over the coronavirus will be won 
when humanity finds a drug that is empirically proven to be effective, and above all, the vaccine that will protect everyone. And it is men and women of science, he says, that we trust will find both. It is fortunate that faith in science and in reason is, is declared here, it reassessed here, it's still Bashir speaking, when obscurantism is flourishing. Among fanatics of all stripes, of course, but also, for example, among those who consider that the discourse of scientists on climate change is just that, an opinion like any other. Many of us today, I assume, share uh, Bashir's point. We agree that COVID-19 will hopefully be defeated by, defeated by science. We are presently all focused on vaccinating the majority of our population to attain herd immunity and go back to our daily lives. And that is true. It is clear that COVID-19, the disease, the disease caused by the coronavirus can only be de defeated by the discovery of either a vaccine or a treatment that can eradicate it. But what about the causes of the coronavirus, which is more likely of natural or animal origins through spillover infections that had spread to humans via an intermediary wildlife, wild, wildlife host? What about it? As usual, in the same spirit as Western modernity, we focus on the symptoms rather than the real treatment of the disease. The vaccines and treatments will not bring a victory over the coronavirus. They will give us a small victory over COVID-19, but the problem will remain the same. Soon, another coronavirus will emerge. There is no doubt about it. This is probably the reason why Bashir insists on the importance of dealing with climate change. Because it is true, this corona, like most of the coronaviruses we know since 1965, are effects of, of climate change in our relationships to the environment. In the name of the colonial anthropocentric understanding of the world, human beings are exploiting the planet, its land, its forests, and its waters at an unsustainable rate. This prevents nature from balancing itself. Deforestation had led us, for example, to lower CO2 levels, which in turn has led to the, to, has led to the climate crisis we face today. One of the most rapid consequences of this climate change is the relentless destruction of animal, animal habitats. Added to all this is our treatments of farm animals, which are put in unsustainable living conditions by blind capitalist, capitalism for the sake of profit as a virus that spilled over from an intermediary wildlife host, SARS-CoV-2 is clearly an effect of the destruction of an animal's natural habitat or the disastrous conditions of hygiene and stress in which we have put some animals and that facilitate the development and the transmission of pathogens. We are all familiar with the bird flu, SARS, mad cow disease, swine flu, etc. The outbreak of each one of these epidemics was either due to climate change or the living conditions of animals directly linked to unbridled capitalism. What is interesting, however, is that we seem to be surprised when we heard that um, uh, we knew that it was just a matter of time before a virus like this attacked us. Bill Gates is not necessarily a genius, for predicting this pandemic in 2018. The risk was clear. It still is. We know that another one will appear in the future if we don't change our relationship to nature. It's just that in the name of rationality, coloniality and capitalism, rooted in the deification of the modern subject, master and possessor of nature, that we do not seriously engage with the repercussions of toxic coloniality. So I don't think that traditionally conceived science will save us. Science will stop, like painkillers, the symptoms of the disease. It will not cure it. What we need to do is pay more attention to another science that we tend to underestimate. The science that the African traditions and all the traditions 
that the West has deemed indigenous and unworthy. And all in that conceive, all these traditions conceive that there is no development except the one that aims at perfect communion with the world that welcomes us. It is this science and technologies developed by African concepts such as Nite or Ubuntu that will save us in the future because those are the concepts, the relationships with to the world that will treat nature and the environment in such a sustainable way that it will not return itself against us. In fact, while the arrogance of the West has led since the modern era to the conception of man as master and possessor of nature, indigenous worldviews in most cases understand that life is dependent on the balance of all its inhabitants. Leopold Sedar Senghor reminds us of this when he tells us that in our African traditions, everything depends on the vital force. Animals, trees, waters, and even rocks are endowed, endowed with a force that leads to the creator. God does not create the world from nothing. They breathe life through their, through their own energy. In these societies, nature can only be treated with friendship and kindness. Such a relationship to the world will help us cope with climate change and many of the threats that affect us today. It is by changing our relation to the world that we can save it. Any true science, the goal of which is to increase life, will have to be based on this ontology of kindness. This ontology, this ontology is clearly not an ontology of arrogance, but an ontology of humility that is based on the realization that we all participate in the same vitalities, humans as well as nature. COVID-19, the bushfires in Australia and California, and the droughts in Southern Africa this year are warnings. We risk the real doom day if we do not seriously engage with our colonial wisdom. As I started, as I said, said earlier, could this dig? Way of them. In conclusion, I would add, Kuwait Khamsabob. Deep inside, we know who we are. 500 years of coloniality have succeeded in making us, as Africans, imagine that the good and actually the world, imagine that the, the beautiful and the good and the sublime is reserved to a selected few. Our solutions in Africa and our imaginations are often turned towards the West. This crisis will at least have the merit to free some energies and to make us see some glimmers of hope. What is interesting in this crisis is, among other things, how much it has shown that the world is a small village and how much it reminds us that we also have the means to transform it. In only two months, a virus that supposedly started in China had spread to every corner of the world. So in just a few months, for months, the world had also closed in the fastest and most radical way that we have never seen. In, had, in, in the African continent, we had only one choice, to turn inward and take back our subjectivity confiscated by 500 years of coloniality. I am not saying that this was radical. We too, at a certain point, had copied, sometimes without even much thought, a system of lockdown or social distancing that does not take into account our respective particularities. But let's also remember that for the first two months of the pandemic, it seems that African creative cap capacities had been boosted by, with steroids. African countries aware of the limits of the aid had turned on themselves to create factories that manufactured masks in Ghana, uh, gels in most of our universities, medical units, whole medical units in Uganda for less than $10,000, respirator, respirators in Senegal, Ghana, Uganda, Ivory Coast, Kenya, and so on. Those who usually, usually opt for the sterile position of the spectators had understood in the space of the closure of the borders and the race for new technologies that it is to themselves that they owe their salvation, even if the others had difficulties 
in seeing that they will, they will walk. Finally, I don't think we are safe. We're not. I'm not saying that the situation can't explode here on the continent either. It's a possibility. But what this virus has shown is also the power of humility in dealing with the problems that challenge our humanity. The realization of the limits of our resources and our insignificance in the face of the greatness of the world in which we live. It is our, our humility that will save us. I will let you uh, listen to the words of Chronix, who reminds us that it is only when we burn the foundation of the provincial epistemology of the West that we will be able to see the end of the tunnel. But as we say here in Senegal, Louis Ram, Senyagalajem, everything that you see crawling is going uh, towards a, a certain goal, has a certain goal. So anyway, um, uh, I'm gonna finish here uh, in music and share with you the song that kept coming to my mind as I was um, writing uh, this, this paper. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Highly, 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 highly. Ah, boy, you never want me forever burning. Can you see when the tables turn? Me say, you love her, I and I preaching. So every land of hate will burn. I was there when the ships came and chastised in a Jesus name. Wonder if me crazy, wonder if me sane. But the whole of Rome go go up in a flame. I know nothing to me walk in a room and start a fire, start a fire. And I know nothing to me walk in a room and start a fire, start a fire. God, them a wonder how a little African I go bond down the whole line in a Vatican. But I know nothing to me walk in a room. Start a fire, start a fire. If you go home, the whole demographic. And when me talk, I be no hypocritic. When you say Rome, I eat no geographic. But if I you feel wear the cap, then I you with a fit. When me say Rome, me a talk all liar. I hear the silasi, I the power of the chayad. The eagle and the dragon and the bear are spit fire, but them can't overthrow the conquering lion. All right, so if Rome really burns, then um, we may be able to think uh, of the world uh, from a completely uh, different, uh, different way. So thank you, uh, everybody, uh, Brenda and Todd, uh, back to you. Thank you, Shek. You have your first question from Apollo Omoko. Go ahead, Apollo, if you wanna turn your video on, it's up to you, you are enabled. Uh, can you hear me, Todd? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much, Todd. And thank you, Sheikh, for a provocative talk that was good to think with. Um, I do however, have a couple lines of questioning. One is pragmatic and one is more philosophical. Um, it's readily apparent to me the ways in which the statement by um, the Director General of the WHO and the two French scientists participate in a kind of colonial discourse that you are rightly critiquing. Uh, it's not self-evident to me how Emmanuel Macron's statement fits quite that paradigm. I will readily concede that I do not know the full context for the quote, so I might be missing something. But it seems to me that it's open for a more charitable reading, which is to say that it was, it's recognizing that uh, given the limited resources of most African economies, that they would require support eventually. And we can see that playing out in terms of what has now come to be called vaccination apartheid, for example, uh, in which, uh, so it's, I, I would like to hear a little bit more about why it's problematic to be saying that our African partners 
may need technical support as the virus plays out. Uh, and I also appreciated uh, the claim you made more or less in passing, uh, contesting a binary opposition between uh, Western colonial discourses and African ostensibly anti-colonial discourses, uh, because you are right to call attention to the ingenuity and inventiveness that occurred in various parts of the African continent around COVID. Uh, but two things. First, there are pragmatic explanations why the continent generally fared better, including such, a th such things as there is far less international travel uh, between uh, uh, from Africa to the rest of the world than there is, say, from Europe to China or America to China. So it wasn't necessarily that Africans were performing better, it's that the circumstances predisposed them to fare better, at least in the short run. Uh, and I would also point out that there is a rogues gallery of African authorities that have performed disastrously. Off the top of my head, the late president of Burundi, Pierre Nkuruzinza, and the recently departed president of Tanzania, John Pombe Makufuli, who engaged in the most reckless and irresponsible form of COVID denialism, often in the name of African tradition, uh, or the president of Madagascar who came up with a concussion that was clearly of no medicinal value whatsoever, but was then ordered by several African countries, again in the name of African solidarity or Pan-Africanism. And finally, and sorry for going on, a more philosophical question. I think a plea for epistemological modesty is all for the good, it's very well motivated. A critique of Western epistemological arrogance is well grounded, but I wanted to hear more about uh, in other words, I was troubled by the level of abstraction at which you articulated a kind of African gnosis that was going to be a, a solution or part of a solution to the crisis of environment and so on. I would like to hear a little more about how that plays out in practice concretely. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Apollo, uh, for um, uh, for this very, very um, interesting and thought-provoking uh, questions. Uh, I'm going to start uh, with the philosophical questions and then move uh, towards the more the more pragmatic um, questions. Uh, what here again? Uh, what I'm proposing uh, is uh, me methodological approaches. Uh, to, to problems uh, that we have to engage with. Uh, and so, so, so and the statement that, that I'm making here is valid for both the, the pragmatic questions and the more philosophical questions. But let's talk about philosophical questions. One of the limits, I, I think, uh, as, and, as, and as I have stated several times, of rationality is one, uh, this illusion, the, the, the centrality, this arrogant centrality and anthropocentric um, understanding of the subject as master and possessor of nature. That leads to a relation to nature that is a relation of domination. You know, like our relation to the world is that this, this nature, the environment, that which we dominate, that which we stand and that which we use. And this is exactly what has led to the imbalance uh, that um, uh, we, we're living with and like, we're living uh, with here now. Uh, so the modern, the, the modern time and the centralization of the subject and anthropocentric, the, the anthropocentric relation to the world in itself is the very issue that we're dealing with right now when we talk about, uh, uh, how do you call them, uh, climate change and stuff. The climate change, I feel like, is an effect of the very problem, which is literally an ontological relation to the world. Now, if you flip it uh, and, and, and see what uh, these African gnosis or these African world groups in relation to the world, and before even gnosis, right? Let's, let's look at them, uh, several of these 
it is hard for me to say African and generalize like that, right? But this is the case, for example, for the Wolof, this is the case for even the Bantu, if we go back to temples, this is the case for the Bambara and many African uh, understanding ontologies are based on the, the, the idea that life, that the existence is vitalist. It is linked to, to, to the insufflation of the vital energy to, to, to that which exists, right? In that sense, our relation to nature cannot be, as Senghor would say, or as a negative scholar, but also as um, I, I strongly believe, uh, would, our relation to, to, to nature is therefore not a relation of domination of, of something that you have to use, but it is based on balance of some collaboration. In that sense, and that's how I say, it, that very way of understanding the world is fundamentally ecological based on kindness and humility. And here, when I'm saying humility, it's the humanity of the human subject in face of the entirety of the world, which leads naturally to um, an eco-friendly understanding of life. And as I argued earlier, the problem with these coronaviruses, not COVID-19, is the imbalance of the world. Like, let's take the example of COVID-19. If in reality, because we're not very sure, right? But if in reality the COVID-19 came from certain animals, it is directly because their habitat had been destroyed. Or else it's because we have used animals and kept them in spaces that um, uh, led them to weaken their immune system and, de and develop pathogens. In that sense, um, a more humble, a more vitalist understanding of the world would lead to more balance and ultimately prevent, not cure, but prevent some of the, 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 the issues that we deal with now and that are uh, based on the um, uh, world imbalance. You know, like um, most of these problems, that's exactly what I'm saying. That why I say that most of the issues that we deal with are less the problems, but the effects of the real problem, which is the centralization of the modern subject and our very um, useful relation to, to nature and the world. That's what I'm getting at. Uh, so, so no, it's, I, I don't think it's just an abstract thing. It's also a very, very concrete and practical. I'm calling for different um, relations to, to the world and also different understanding of some um, developments and, and whatnot, you know, so very practical in that sense. And as for the pragmatic questions, I think I'm gonna start with the Macron question and then move uh, towards some, uh, the, what has happened in, in certain African countries. But if you listen to Macron, on, on the one hand, I believe in, in universal solidarity, absolutely no doubt about it. But listen to Macron, completely infantilizing the discourse or the relation to Africa and African subjects is completely infantilizing. Basically, what he's saying is wait for a second, just wait, make sure that you contain and you be careful, we are going to solve our issues and come back and help you solve yours. That's the traditional discourse of help, which in its engagement with helping, dehumanizing the, 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 the object of the help. In that sense, um, uh, that help is more damaging because it is dehumanizing than anything else. You know, this is what the wall of says, the hand that gives is always on top of the one that receives. But beyond that also, beyond the idea of help of not help, I feel like there's another discourse that is happening on the other side. And that discourse is the same discourse of the discourse of modernity which while helping and therefore dehumanizing, dehumanizes, affirms one's own humanity. So when Macron talks like that, Macron is not talking about Africa, but Macron is talking to all the French uh, subjects that are listening to, to, to him and therefore humanizing them while dehumanizing others. That is why I have a very strong critique of any idea of help. Now, it's, I, I agree that it's a very difficult, it's a slippery slope, right? Because at the same time, uh, uh, there, we, we should uh, think of our common humanity. As, and, and the example that you give is, is right on spot. And it is the example of um, the way that the Western uh, powers are, have been hurting uh, the, the vaccines right now. Uh, and for the last question, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Again, what I'm proposing here is um, uh, 
uh, I'm using these cases, and, and of course, I, I actually um, kind of um, uh, said that besides the fact that I'm using examples here, Africa and Europe, um, this is some, somewhat of a simplification. But what matters most, I think, is what I say, the, the very foundation of what I say, which is that um, uh, in this particular instance, it is arrogance of the, of the, of the Western subject and um, uh, what um, I have seen as more of a humble relation to the world uh, from the African subject that um, has led to certain relations to this pandemic. But of course, there will be examples when um, uh, we, 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 we used, uh, and we have always done that on the African context, right? We use African concepts. We call Africanity to read it in very simplistic ways. And that's precisely what happens in Tanzania and beyond even health, right? That this is what often happens with many of the dictators that use loosely African concepts and apply it in some ridiculous and very simplistic ways. But as a matter of fact, what I'm saying here is this, at the end of the day, we as human beings were hit by the pandemic because as modern subjects, we presented ourselves as masters and possessors of nature. Two, we also came in and um, engaged in the beginning with this pandemic with total uh, trust to, to, to the, our understanding of predictability. Uh, and, and trust in, um, uh, in, in, in this science that promises that they can master what will come. But when you are on the African continent, I think you are, you, you already know that you don't master much. And that's exactly what happened with many of our, of our governments, at least in the beginning, before they, 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 they started to, 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 to change course. First couple of months, most of the governments got really scared. In Senegal, that was the case, um, in, in several African countries, the, the, the governments get really scared because they know that they don't master much. So what they have done is um, uh, prevention, which started working until um, uh, some of us started lose guards. So again, this is an, an epistemic, um, a, a call uh, for, for an epistemic stand um, in ways in which we engage with our present and um, uh, our future. Uh, Paul, did you have a follow on that or? I don't really have a follow-up. I just wanted Sheikh to get a chance to see the face of his tormentor. I had thought I'd turned my video on and I hadn't. Thanks for the clarification. They were quite helpful. Thanks. Okay. Then, uh, you have another question or comment from Sarah Staub. Sarah, go ahead. Your video is enabled if you want to turn it on. Sorry, were you talking to me? My Zoom disconnected and came back and started. Yeah, you're, you're on the, you have the floor for your question <laughs> or comment. Sorry, thank you. Um, um, thank you, I really enjoyed your talk and I've been, um, I think this is more of a comment, although I'd love um, any specific um, uh, resources for learning kind of more about the toxic coloniality because um, I'm doing a similar argument. I've been looking at media representations of Madagascar's herbal medicine cure um, and noticing also the, the theme of governance and control over, um, you know, we can see it with the vaccines, you know, not having them be open sourced to allow African pharmaceutical companies to create it, but also not giving access to African countries to get the vaccine. Um, and, um, but what I noticed with the Madagascar treatment is China also used Artemisia, which is the main ingredient in the treatment. They used it on a, a lot. It was one of their main medicines for COVID-19. It was also a primary medicine for COVID in uh, 2009 or 2007. Um, but, the media representations of it, and this might go more possibly to uh, what Apollo was talking about, was that it is a, a quack medicine um, that was untested and um, 
where when it was being promoted by China, it was also untested, but we didn't have the same visceral reaction. And then uh, German researchers and US researchers tested it. We found that Artemisia does inhibit um, the viral replication and was actually in, in fairly effective in cell studies. And now we're using it in clinical trials in the US and Mexico and in Europe and in Israel. Um, but the discourse changed. So it was, this is a qu quack cure, it's not effective at all. And then when it was found to be at least somewhat effective, it was, well, we shouldn't let Africa use it because it could be hurt their, their issues with malaria, um, which is a whole other issue of governance and control because there's no, their argument was that it could lead to resistance, but there's not solid scientific evidence to support that notion. Um, so um, that was, you know, kind of tangent, but just uh, seeing these other issues of governance and control over um, what Africa is doing and the kind of discursive practices um, that we have, particularly in our media representation. Um, and, um, but yeah, so sorry, that's um, a bit of a tangent. And then, but if you have, I don't know if you've also seen the issues of governance and control um, with COVID-19. And um, if you have resources for uh, toxic coloniality um, that I could look into more. Okay. Uh, Sarah, thank you very much. Your, your comments were, you were not going on tangents at all. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's very clear and actually it's really interesting. Um, toxic coloniality is a term that I just co coined in the past 24, 48 hours. Um, so, um, uh, so, but you know, we can talk later. Um, I'll share my email, uh, maybe as a as a text that, that talks about similar things. Uh, I I'm, I'm glad that you talked about Artemisia. Um, you know, I don't. I I I actually started writing a little bit, added it to my text, and I put it away because I didn't have much information. So I would definitely um, appreciate it if you can share. Uh, some of um, uh, the, the information that you're talking about. Uh, what is clear to me, right, uh, when it comes to, 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 to the general um, reception of Artemisia is this. Uh, on the one hand, yes, I am I'm spe skeptical whenever a head of state sponsors any time of type of medication, especially uh, the brother from Madagascar, who is funny in his own ways. However, uh, the, the, the discourse, on Artemisia was extremely colonial. You know, the discourse that says, if you want a medication to be accepted as valid, it has to go first to phase one, phase two, phase three, while other parts of the world have been dealing with science differently, engaging with medicine and solving their problems for thousands of years is itself ridiculous. No matter how you, how you put it. And that is the coloniality of science in itself that's at stake here. Mm -hmm. Madagascar in particular, I was in Madagascar about a year ago, but um, even before, uh, how do you call it, COVID-19, Madagascar has all these different ways of healing um, different types of um, viruses and especially different types of flus. Uh, and Madagascar is known for, for, the, for its biodiversity and it's known for thousands of years of um, uh, medical uh, interventions from uh, the, the, the traditional medicine. And by the way, um, plug in SIT, we do have a program, uh, a summer program in Madagascar that just focuses on traditional med medicine because it is central. So how can we not trust other forms of science that just, that, that just do not follow uh, whatever is called Western rationality and Western testing or whatever they call it. It is another instance of, of, um, uh, of, of, of coloniality uh, hidden under the, the words uh, that, that had really more, more value than, than meaning. And one of which is the idea of science and rationality. 
So, so thank you, thank you for 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 bring for bringing for bringing all of that. That's, that's actually interesting, extremely interesting. And please, um, let's let's share um information later because I definitely would like to to read more about the things that you're talking about. And I'm not surprised. How many you know in Senegal, for example, sometimes you go to the hospital, they can't cure you. The doctor will take you to a traditional doctor, who will cure you. Right. We know, for example, that yellow fever, if you want to get cured in Senegal quickly uh, of yellow fever, you don't go to the doctor. Uh, and there, there's several things like that. So, you know, but never will they be accepted. And that's part of um, uh, coloniality. Thank you, sir. Uh, your next question or comments from Kofi Mustafa. Go ahead, Kofi. Uh, thank you, um, Tad. And, uh, I think I, I really enjoyed the talk from Sheikh. Um, and thank you very much for this thought-provoking um, discussion. Um, I think basically I agree with you a lot in terms of um, relational ontology where we need to be careful the way we develop in and um, also affecting the environment in a way that is not sustainable. I think that is very um, essential. Um, also, pretty much, it is very clear as to the colonial, um, um, toxic coloniality that you're talking about and how um, Western powers will always regard Africa and also try to um, bring Africa in that colonial web and context um, in terms of helping and giving the help and all that. But my question always come to the fact that who do we put the blame to? And for example, if Macron says that, yeah, we're gonna help Africa, right? Um, is it because he's European that we will take issue with it? Or is it because, because initially I was also scared about COVID-19 when it started as to how it's gonna impact Ghana and, uh, and most of most African nations with the way it was devastating America. I mean, I was in America at the time. So I was thinking about how it was devastating the US and if the same impact is to be transferred to Ghana, how it was going to affect Ghana. Now, the first approach to COVID-19 in Ghana was Ghana running to the World Bank to procure a $1 billion um, loan. That loan was supposed to be used to um, cushion the, the citizens, right, um, for the impact of COVID-19. Eventually, what happened was that the government never used the money in that sense. The money went into the pockets of the government officials. There was a two weeks lockdown. The government had to lift the, the lockdown because it couldn't sustain it, not because the virus was not in Ghana or not because it had managed, like had an effective way of managing the virus. And that is why it lifted the lockdown, but it was because it could not sustain it. People were screaming and I, I, you could see videos on, um, on social media from Nigeria and Ghana, people saying the hunger virus is more, um, more pertinent than the coronavirus. So they were more scared of the hunger virus than coronavirus. But what helped for me personally, what I think what helped Africa was the fact that the virus spread more um, intensely within a close range than people uh, in outside, right? So when Africans normally socialize outside our uh, rooms, outside um, buildings and all that, that really helped because then it could not be transferred to many people. Then also our ways of lives also helped a lot. And that's why it wasn't devastating. But when coming back to the way our African leaders approached the virus and how we were able, how we failed miserably in terms of dealing with it. And had it not been the fact that some other circumstances lifted Africa from this pandemic, it was going to be disastrous. What kind of research did, you, what, what was the investment that African leaders put into researching, even if we had med medications that helped us? What was the investment that African leaders put in putting out this research? And it's always going to be that because um, 
people have made vaccines, they want to promote it and others. So they are also advocating for it. But so if you have something that is um, good, you need to also promote it in a way that others will accept it. And that's one of the things. Um, and maybe I'm also going on going on. For example, the Ghanaian finance minister recently has to come to the US for COVID-19 complication. But the same finance minister had, ad, had allocated $100 million to build a cathedral and not to build a hospital or invest in research, lab, laboratory research and other things. But when he got the coronavirus with all this implication, he ran to the US for medication or for medical attention. So how do we do this? And recently we know what happened in Tanzania. He refused. These are the, COVID is not real and all that. But when he was trapped, he had to go to Kenya and eventually even fly out of Africa for attention. So, like I said, I agree with you a lot in terms of the concepts and theories, the theoretical perspectives you brought out, relational ontology and all that. But also, where do we put the blame to the West or African leaders? Where our African leaders become very irresponsible and do not deal with internal issues appropriately. Um, and so you cannot blame other people much for our woes. I think that's um, my question. Where do we put the blame? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kofi. Uh, you, you, I think you asked, you, your questions are, are extremely interesting. Um, the, the, what I'm, 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 I, what I'm going to say first is um, but really, the question is not necessarily individuals, right? Or for that matter, Europe in itself. But the questions are the systems and the structures that um, determines our relation to the world. And in that sense, um, coloniality is at work um, often within our government. Right? It's absolutely no doubt about it. Coloniality is at work. Uh, within um, uh, within our governments, the example that you you gave in Kenya are absolutely right. You know um, how 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 Africa how, how how different is the ontology that limits the benefits uh, that that should be shared to all to a few? How 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 less colonial can that be? You know, and those are the problem with coloniality. Uh, the, and, and, and again, arrogance, like it, it is extremely arrogant uh, beyond um, the ethical question. It, it, is, it is somewhat a mark of arrogance to believe that one is better than everybody else to be able to, 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 to take that which is for, for, for all. And again, Africanity and African concepts have often been used uh, in a very simplistic way for the benefit of, this, of the same, especially the leaders. So um, how does, um, how the, the question is, how do we go beyond coloniality? And um, uh, how uh, is it that um, uh, the, 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 some African worldview, some African understanding of the world, but also some African and non-colonial um, ways of engaging with the world how can that have, can that help us as we move forward? Or also, and more importantly, how has that helped us uh, in um, uh, during the pandemic? You give um, the example of the fact that um, the, 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 some of the ways that African lived, right? Um, that that is fundamentally different um, from from um, the way we sometimes live in cities and outside of cities, right? One of the interesting things about um, uh, the, the, some, some government has just jumped and locked down. Uh, while in many African countries, actually, people have access to, to, um, uh, to, 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 to spaces where they can engage without being too close to each other. Uh, how could that have been used uh, to, to, to solve some of the issues that we have now, instead of this, as I say at a certain point, instead of just copying literally uh, Western um, understandings of Western ways to solve these issues. Those are the questions that we need, that we need to ask. You know, sometimes, and, and really, Kofi, I, um, I, I don't have all the answers. 
But what I see here happening is how a certain understanding of um, rationality and a certain trust uh, in um, coloniality had led to the demise of, of, of some and how um, uh, the fact that the humility that comes with being African, and here not just based on um, African worldviews, by the way, but sometimes the humility comes from our very modern experiences. When you are an African, you are bound to be humble. And that humility can lead us to be a lot more careful as we move forward. So the condition of being African in itself, that does not mean now that this is essentially African and that this belongs uh, to Africa. But, but this can give us an option as the, as the decolonial scholars would say. Yeah. Thanks, Kofi. Uh, your next question or comment, I believe is from one of your colleagues at SIT, Saeed Gawid. Go ahead, Saeed. Uh, thanks, uh, Todd. Uh, does, does my voice carry, Sheikh? Yes, you're fine. Yeah, Very thank well. you. Thanks, thanks, Todd. It's it's really a pleasure to to listen to you, Sheikh. You know, like thank you so much. Uh, uh, you know, like I'm quite familiar with your passion, you know, for the continent and for the philosophy of the continent, and it's always a pleasure to be, you know, part of uh, gatherings such as this. You know, to just listen to you know, our colleagues who share like a lot of things in common and a lot of interests. So thank you so much. I, I think this was, uh, you know, quite, uh, quite interesting and quite, uh, as it has been said, quite thought provoking, you know, uh, sort of like take on uh, COVID-19 and, uh, you know, the, the relationship between uh, uh, modernity and the African, you know, uh, and uh, the idea of Africa, I would say, in relation to the response to the uh, uh, to the virus and also, uh, you know, to to the global pandemic and how this was handled uh, uh, across the continent. Uh, let me let me let me say this. Just let me say just one thing about about modernity, which is quite a you know sort of like quite a messy and untidy, you know, sort of like notion and concept. I think even one of its strongest proponents, you know, not to name him, but, you know, Habermas always talked about that as, as, a, as an incomplete, but I think what he really meant was that a very disorganized and untidy uh, concept. Uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, I'm basically, I'm joining from Morocco just for our, our colleagues in the audience. And there is a, you know, like a, a wonderful, uh, you know, Moroccan historian, you know, Abdullah al uh, who is actually like a very uh, confirmed uh, uh, and convinced uh, proponent of modernity, uh, uh, coming to it from historical materialism uh, for that matter. Uh, who in the past, you know, like back in the in the in the seventies, I think you know he made the statement about how uh, it was Europe that discovered that the Earth was round, and therefore it got to all parts of the world, and the rest of the world, in a sense, would have no option but to follow suit because there is basically nothing else you know to discover, at least on the, on this planet. Uh, and and this is you know in many ways of course this is the the the, the discourse that uh, that Europe in particular but the West in general you know has been you know promoting for at least the last four or five centuries. Uh, but this COVID you know sort of like conjecture here um, you know you you have you have uh, approached this also. Uh, from within the perspective of uh, arrogance, you know, and of course, which has always been, you know, an integrated component of, you know, the uh, the uh, 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 cosmological view of the world from a Western perspective. Uh, but I, you know, I wonder if you, I wonder if you considered this also moment. Uh, as maybe a manifestation of some sort of epistemic decadence of this of this modernity, you know, really, if we look at what's been happening in Europe and the situation in which Europe is today, uh, 
I mean, I, what I see here is uh, to just use actually the language of, you know, confirmed modernists. What I see here is a sequence of uh, exhaustion of systems of modernity, you know, and there is a lot of, which, which is also quite interesting, given also uh, the, uh, the, 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 the the supremacy that's being provided reason, you know, and reasoning and so on. But what I have been seeing myself is fundamentally being a lot of, you know, improvisation, you know, a lot of hesitation, uh, which to me are indicators that the system is probably coming to, you know, to exhaustion. Uh, and there are, there, there are still just like, you know, sort of like a, you know, a dying, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, creature, body, uh, the, 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 those last three flexes, you know, that usually, you know, come out before the final expiry, you know, breath of life. Uh, 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 the, uh, Europe waited until I was fully vaccinated with AstraZeneca, you know, to come forth with, oh, wait a minute, this is no good, you know, like, and with actually again, you know, like uh, like a discourse, uh, of clearly that implies, you know, that the value of the human is actually the value that is bestowed on the Western human, and that the rest of humanity, in in many ways, you know, do not count in this in this equation. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, and I felt like at at first I was like, oh my God, like what did I just inject in my body? before I realized, you know, that there is fundamentally no, uh, you know, no reason for me, you know, as an individual subject from this uh, southern hemisphere, you know, to be concerned about what uh, this uh, discourse is, is all about, given that, you know, we have an actually an, uh, in, in Morocco, I think Morocco is, has been, uh, you know, able to manage this crisis, you know, quite, you know, quite nicely given Morocco's, you know, you know, really very limited resources. So uh, in this, you know, I, I see all this, you know, played out in, in almost what leaks, what, what seems to me as a, a last act, you know, in a play that's, that's been, you know, performing for probably three to four centuries now. So, I mean, I don't know if, uh, Sheikh, if you want, you know, to talk a little bit about whether whether this is, you know, like even an angle that we can uh, look at this from or uh, whether you see this as, you know, a continued, you know, arrogance, you know, that is definitely in, you know, couched in the philosophical outlook, not only the philosophical, but also the geopolitical outlook, outlook of modernity and Europe. And thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Saeed. Thanks, thanks for your very thought-provoking comments. Uh, I think you're absolutely, well, on, on the one hand, I think you're absolutely right uh, that um, uh, this is the, the, the last moments of the empire and like any beast, it has to kick. Uh, to, to, to get, to, to try to survive. Um, rather than exhaustion though, uh, I, well, yes, exhaustion in some ways, uh, but I, I think that it's just that the, the veil is being lifted. Um, it, it's, it's really, it's, it's interesting. When I, when I speak and look at someone, I have the impression that there is an audience, but when there is nobody, when I can't see anyone, uh, I feel like I'm speaking to myself and Saeed just turned off, turned off his camera. That's what happened with Kofi and for some reason I was thrown off. I didn't focus anymore. <laughs> so anyway, but Saeed, what I'm saying here is, um, uh, the, the thing is, I, I wouldn't even think of exhaustion as if it was working at a certain point and now it's dying. I feel like the very foundation of Western modernity is an illusion and a lie. Like, let's, let's, let's think about it, right? Um, uh, the idea of the subject as a rational subject that engages in the world and that is a, a, a master and possessor of nature. We know where, where that's from. Um, uh, the idea of democracies. Uh, what democracy, right? The, the very idea of the birth of democracy is inseparable from, from the, the, the empires that, that, that went along uh, with it. Uh, so, 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 so I feel like the, the idea of, of Europe, the, of the West in itself, and the idea of modernity was always based on a promise 
that was um, uh, that that would that that was rigged from its from from the beginning. And the very example of that is what just happened with the U.S. elections. So so and, and what what happened with the U.S. elections to me. Everybody feels, well, not everybody, but I, I heard a lot of um, uh, uh, special news uh, outlets um, uh, being so surprised. But that was the most logical, uh, that's the, that's, that was the most logical thing that could ever happen. Uh, the idea of in, in a place like the United States, uh, the white supremacist uh, person is elected as president. That's the most logical thing that could ever happen for anybody who lived in the US for a certain first, for a certain time as a minority. So anyway, all of this to say what? That this promise of modernity is not really, this is, it's, it's not that, um, I, I don't see exhaustion, but I think the veil is being lifted. At the beginning, the promise of felicity and, and enlightenment, as I, as I said in my talk, was, um, uh, was just an enlightenment for the few. And the other part of the world was living in um, uh, in, in in darkness, uh, as as I said before. So yes, on the one hand, I, I definitely agree with you, uh, but on the other, I wouldn't say that it's exhaustion. It's not that modernity is incomplete, as Habermas would say. It it, it is that the, the, the very foundation of moder like of modernity is um, is is fraught. You know, because when they speak about their enlightenment, when they are having their dreams, we are having our nightmare. That, that's basically um, the way I, I, I understand and engage uh, with, with modernity. And the example that you give is right, it's right on spot. Say, so think about how we as human beings are dependent on Western uh, understandings of the world, but also their, 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 their feelings of the moment. Like even as scholars, calling ourselves as African scholars, your reaction was exactly mine. It took me a minute, actually, until I talked to you. Uh, when they started talking about the vaccine, I jumped because my mother just I was just vaccinated. But after our discussion the other day, I started thinking, how do we as human beings depend so much on the Western uh, relations to the world and their understanding of science or whatnot to determine what's good and what's bad. It's, it's, it, and that's, that's the thing though, like in interpolating Kofi as well, um, we are part of coloniality and we are parts and parcels of the system. And this talk is an invitation to, to engage differently uh, with humility, uh, with the world. And COVID-19 to me is just a pretext uh, but um, uh, what the, the cure, I think, to, to, to the pervasiveness of coloniality is humility. Okay, I'm going to go for one last question from Jorg Vigratz. Uh, Jorg, you have the floor for our last question of the session. Yeah, hi, good evening, Chai. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. Um, very uh, powerful um, talk and analysis. <clears throat> I just have a question how your analysis is, uh, is affected by kind of the fact that capitalism is institutionalized now in, uh, in many African countries. Um, and, and by the day, you could argue that capitalist civilization is ever getting more embedded also culturally. So how will that affect your analysis about the culture of being humble and this and the other that you have you know, uh, where they talk about particular gener generations, etc. But you're plugged into a global system, right, of consumerism, materialism, uh, social media, etc. So how do you foresee that? And, and basically the way nature is treated by kind of the p powerful economic actors, what is the difference there between a, 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 a Kenyan businessman who exploits nature and and a British businessman, right, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So, do you really see there is a turnaround moment coming, or that balance of forces can shift, or is it the same civilizational logics and cultural logics in terms of business and short term, and etc., that will just just continue to dominate? And I don't know how one can predict that 
Western Empire uh, is on its last leg. I don't know wh wh whether social scientists that we all are have the data to predict that kind of scenario. So I just wonder how similar to colleagues who have very confidently said at the beginning of the pandemic, neoliberalism has ended. But I I'm not sure where the what kind of data they use. I mean, is it just we sit on our laptops and we declare it to be ended? Uh, disregard, uh, you know, without regard to the empirical reality, which my the first respondent, right, has talked about the reality of government, of elites, of business interests, and all that. So how would that affect your analysis? Um, you're, you're absolutely, I'll, I'll get back to the, to the last part of the question. I'm going to start by saying this, right, one of the from, from just these questions um, that I received from Apollo, from Kofi, one of the things that I'm gonna change in this text, right, is the beginning. And um, when I will, I, will, I will argue that beyond, that, that, that I'm, I'm really engaged here in um, sort of um, uh, 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 what the French would call a future anterior, right? The question that I'm trying to ask is um, sort of a really, uh, Afrofuturist question, right? What could have been had we adopted um, uh, these Afrocentric or this Africa, not Afrocentric, Africa centered epistemologies, you know? Uh, so, so that's really what, what I want to do rather than uh, what I have done in some ways, right? Um, so, so just, just to, to, to clarify, um, you know what? I think that African subjects are fundamentally modern. Most African subjects today are fundamentally modern subjects. However, if you look closely, our African ontolog ontologies are not. So we have this constant dichotomy, which is what we have become, fundamentally modern subject. And these um, tools, these technologies, these relations to the world, these glasses that we have that, can, that offer new possibilities. And in some instances, some emerge. And in others, they don't. You know, in the beginning of the of the COVID nineteen, um, it, we, we've seen how arrogance of the West, rooted in Western, uh, how do you call it, um, uh, rationality, has led to their demise. While humility has kept us, some of us, and in some instances, uh, at bay. So um, uh, no, the, the question that you're asking, um, I, I hear you. So in many instances, the Kenyan businessman is exactly the same as the British businessman. The minister of finance um, uh, in Ghana is not different from any colonizers that comes in and pillage Africa. However, does it have to be like that? And do we have the tools? to be able to, to open new paths and new ways of imagining the utterly different. And that's, that's, that's what this paper tries to do at the end of the day, while using now moments in history, such as this one, when we see how humility can question arrogance. And is so that you want to follow up quickly before I get to the last quickly. one. Is that in the end then an issue of power structures and dynamics that are playing out or is, where do you locate causality? How does it play out? The power structure and the dynamics and the very structures are very colonial structures. It doesn't matter if you're in Gambia or in the United States. However, though, there are spaces all across and also pervasiveness in all structures when you find other ways or other ways of engaging with the world as an ontologies and as a manifestation. Right? How do we use that and what happens? You know, and I'm not talking about going back to the past, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is what is it that happens as soon as we have to engage frankly with these spaces? Is it possible? Yes, it is. Is it happening? Yes, it is happening. I don't know if you've heard of the echo villages, for example, who've been engaged and recreated different villages with different um, uh, um, from uh, these, these um, uh, concepts, Nietzsche, Ubuntu, all across the continent. They're definitely not happening at that um, uh, higher end and such, and you know, of the world. And on the other hand, uh, are there data that is showing uh, that it's the last moment of the beast? Uh, it's hard to say, and yes, it, 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 it's something uh, that, is, that is very comfortable in just, in just uh, making these statements. I, I agree with you. Uh, but let's look around as well, right? Are these Western powers what they were? This is the big, you know, take US, take France, take, you know, are they what they were 20 years ago? Uh, 
what do we do with the discussion between between um, the Biden administration and the Xi Jinping administration a couple of days ago? Now, I'm not saying that China um, is not a colonial space, but we definitely see that um, uh, the, 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 there is a limit to the power of um, of certain um, uh, of, of these big ensembles in many ways. Uh, how could we imagine? what just happened in Senegal a couple of weeks ago, a direct confrontation and targets and engagement with French interests that was completely unimaginable 10, 15 years ago. So things are happening right? in one way or another. Um, the new engagement with them, um, uh, and, and here I'm, I'm still talking about big in central states and countries, but even within these democracies, you know, the, 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 the new engagement with coloniality and white supremacy in the United States, for example. Right? I mean, so, so there is something that's happening and that's, that's questioning the very foundation of these modern states. Up to very recently, we talked about um, uh, racism, white supremacy, heteronormativity as anomalies that could be fixed. What we've seen with Me Too, with the Black Lives Movement is finally the engagement with the very foundation of what was before called the social contract, as we realize that it is more and more a racial and a patriarchal contract. So things are happening that we have not seen in the past couple of hundred years. Uh, and um, uh, yes, there is wishful thinking when I speak, but I hope that that will ultimately lead uh, to the demise of, 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 of these colonial uh, spaces and hopefully uh, bring um, uh, the West to a little less arrogant. Thank you, Sheikh. We're over time, so I'm going to end it there as far as the official session. Sheikh, I know it's getting late in Dakar, um, but one of the things we've done in the past is to stop the recording and, and if you're willing to hang out in the room a little bit longer and perhaps chat informally with whoever else wants to hang out, we can do that as long as you are, wish to stay. Um, and I, with that, I'd like to thank you so much and thank you all to the participants and I'll stop the recording. And if you want to stay in the room, I will enable your video and you can chat informally with Sheck as long as he can uh, keep his eyelids open. Uh, thanks, thanks. Again, Sheck. Thanks, thanks all. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Brenda. Thanks to all who asked questions and all, all um, who participated. Uh, I really appreciated this, this discussion. Thank you.